Easy, I'm Scepter and you're tuned in to another Ableton Live tutorial. In today's lesson we're going to be looking at drums, specifically using samples this time instead of a sampler or any synthetic bass drums that we might have made. So some pretty simple concepts but I do think they're quite important. So without further ado, let's get into the lesson. Cool, so here we are inside Ableton Live uh, and as always I'll play through the project first. So I can't really show you the uh, bass and everything that's happening underneath it with this one because it's probably going to be uh, released so I'll leave leave that one for today but just to talk you through it very quickly it's only the same stuff that I showed you in making the bass patch uh, and chain last week it's just I've implemented that really so to focus on the drums um, I've got two groups within the drums one is kick and snare and then the other perk uh, which is all the percussion parts uh, in one and the reason that i do it like that is so i can side chain the uh, percussion against the kick and snare and anything else that i might want to side chain against the kick and snare the um, percussion isn't getting in the way of that but then they're grouped together at the top as drums as a whole anyway so this is quite a you know fast rolling break which has lots of little percussive elements in it but I don't really think it sounds too over the top it still adheres to the minimal kind of style so there's something to bear in mind um, if you're making minimal style drums it doesn't mean that you only have to have three elements you can use um, you know extra bits of percussion as well it's just a case of their alignment within the um, groove itself because Obviously, if you have every little space filled, it doesn't really sound like it's very minimal anymore. But layering things, you can uh, achieve depth and kind of fatness even with uh, single hits. So to go through the kick and snare first, it is only a single uh, kick. So you can hear there's a little... Uh, Hat on the upbeat of one of the kicks uh, in that little loop but that's because I've chopped it out of a break. Um, I don't ever really layer kicks because I always tend to have phase problems with them and I think really if you if you find a good enough kick just spend the time doing that you shouldn't need to layer it anyway it's not the same as kind of the tonal qualities that a snare has. So yeah that's it for the kick really just really simple. Um, the snare is a little bit more complicated in that it's got three layers, which I've got snare one, uh, snare bell, and main snare. So the main snare sounds like this. So it's almost a clap, really. Um, well, it is a clap. 
but then I've got a kind of pitched up acoustic snare on there as well and together they sound like yeah they sound okay if we have a look uh, on an analyzer So there's no real fundamental, um, I guess you could say it's 300 hertz, but it's more built up out of the noise. I think that's just actually just the clap. If we have a look at the pitched up snare, so yeah, a little bit higher, 450. Um, I mean, you could low cut that clap as well, so they are in line and there's nothing under 450, but you know, it doesn't, they don't really seem to in interfere with each other in a negative way. So if you haven't got to cut bits uh, of stuff out, then generally I don't because you could lose a lot of thickness if you're constantly chopping sections out of everything. And then I've got this ride bell, uh, just adding an extra tone, almost like you'd have uh, resonance in a normal acoustic snare drum. That's kind of what I'm simulating with that. It's panned a little bit to the right uh, because the original sample was uh, panned to the left. So I've got it back in the center and then a little bit of reverb uh, on there as well. And the other two snares are dry. Cool, so the kick and the snare group. And you can see that the kick and the snare um, are roughly the same volume overall. Uh, which is a pretty good place to start if you're unsure about drum levels. So then it comes to the many layers of percussion that I've got. Uh, So what I'll do is add them in one part at a time and hopefully we'll be able to hear the uh, effect that they have on the groove as a whole. So for the first 16 anyway, uh, if we start at the top with just the ghost snares. So it's really adding a lot of groove um, to the drums. That kind of shuffle makes it feel a little bit more funky and slightly less static. Um, then we've got what are called standard hat. So it's working with those ghost snares to add to the shuffle. And then I've got a wide hat. which if you're wearing headphones or you're in, uh, in front of your monitors, you'll hear it really spreads the top of the break out. Um, and that effect was made by slightly delaying one of the hats uh, and panning them left and right, and then um, cutting the mids out. Because I find if you use uh, stereo wideners, because it kind of spreads it synthetically in a way, it doesn't have the same weight in the sides that you'd have if you actually, uh, you know, pan something. So do that, pan them left and right, um, delay them slightly, otherwise they won't really be perceived as stereo if they're at exactly the same uh, time. And then uh, consolidate them, save them in your sample pack, and then it's easy to add it into any break that you might be making in the future rather than having to go through that whole process again. So after that, Just a little tambourine hit. Very minimal. And then I've got some faster, faster hats.
which again don't really sound like uh, they're doing much but it does add to the overall feel of the brake in terms of speed. And then on to the next section, we've got another fast hat. So you can hear it's very transient heavy, uh, it's accenting the hats that are already happening. And then the section after that, we've got open tick. So I've got an open one, and then again, very transient heavy short hats. And then lastly, a, or second to last, just a splash ride uh, on the beginning of the bar which sounds really strange by itself. Pan slightly to the right. And then lastly, that is actually a ride bell. So it's a lot of very pointy transients, um, but you can see and in terms of levels, you know, I've turned them all down quite a lot. So they're roughly the same volume and just complementing each other. I'm not really worried about phase alignment uh, at all with hats because this is a kind of messy sounding break. Um, so, you know, when hi-hats phase in and out of each other, if it's only minor, it makes them sound more human. So that's not necessarily a bad thing for me at this point. back to the stripped back version. Now in terms of processing, uh, the majority of these don't have any on. Uh, the occasional one has a high cut on it just to get rid of any information underneath or to make it fit in the same uh, frequency spectrum as where the other hats are sitting. So there's kind of continuity between it. Um, Transit Master on that one really putting and sustain right down. Uh, that's on the tambourine. Wide hat's got nothing. Same high cut on the standard hat. Uh, the ghost snares, I didn't obviously want to high cut them too far, otherwise you're gonna uh, lose the kind of knock that a snare has, even though these are very high pitched in the first place. Um, the kick and the snares above don't have any processing. Uh, on a tool, it's just good sample selection. Uh, and I have pitched them slightly differently, but I think where I've consolidate, yeah, consolidated them, you can't see how far I've pitched it. Um, and I've, the reason I consolidate things a lot now is because I'm forever trying to get rid of clicks and pops and stuff like that. And I, f I find with little sections like this, um, you know, I might accidentally move a fade or chop it somewhere and it hasn't faded properly. So, uh, and that obviously introduces artifacts that you don't want. So once I know it's not, I'll listen to it soloed. Once I know it's not uh, clicking or popping, just Command J. And then now I know as I copy it across, it's not gonna cause me any problems. Uh, and it's really not a big deal to, you know, cut sections out if you want to. Uh, in terms of processing on the groups, as I said, I've got a compressor um, side chain, the kick and snare and then a PSP Vintage Warmer, which it's pretty much a standard preset. It's just 4 dB uh, of drive, just to kind of, because this distorts um, fairly nicely and quite lightly, uh, it's just adding a little bit of gel to the top end. Um, and I've done that after the compressor deliberately because any of the distortion artifacts that it is adding I don't want them to be sucked out by the compressor. I want it to kind of restore um, gel back to the brake as a whole. So I don't want it to be chopping afterwards, if that makes sense. Uh, processing on the drum bus as a whole, uh, I've got uh, decimal, which is not actually 
doing anything in terms of sculpting the sound, it's just for effects throughout the track. Um, a cool thing that someone left in the comments the other day was about using Redoptor to uh, gel your drums together. If you haven't read that comment, it is, I did try it and it, it sounds all right, but it's a little bit unrefined for my taste. It didn't really have the outcome that I wanted. So because I've used um, PSP Vintage Warmer on the percussion pack, I've also used it on the kick and snare, or sorry, the drum bus as a whole. Again, only with two dB a drive, but it does make quite a bit of difference. Yeah, it really lifts that kick uh, back up. If we turn the one on the uh, pack as well. So on to the percussion. And back on the bus. You can see here it just kind of brings it all up to a nicer level uh, and gels it back together a little bit. When you have a break with a lot of elements like this, I find it's not really too hard to get it to gel back together. If we only had, um, you know, two hats, a kick and a snare, it can be harder to get the sensation of uh, groove without using reverb. Uh, I find if anyone has a solution for that, do tell me. Um, so in terms of the processing, effects processing, um, in terms of variation on the bus, I've got a bit crushed um, kind of filter sweep that happens here. And then a couple of just smaller filter downs uh, in a few of the 16s. And then to talk a little bit about the uh, intro, it's you know it's it's not in any kind of finished state yet. But something I like doing a lot is getting an auto filter um, and setting the LFO rate on a bandpass filter to kind of go up and down with some reverb on it. And it's still got the kick on the one that you can hear. So if you're mixing it, you know, you can still um, beat match it fairly easily. At least I can because it's my tune and I know that that kick is on the one, but that's the idea behind it. Bit of delay. Yeah, and that's kind of it really. I, as I say, I can't go really through the rest of the track, um, but what I will do actually is strip the drums back whilst the track's playing so you can kind of hear the impact that they have, uh, the different percussion layers have on how the track feels. Pretty simple one, um, 
not too much to talk about, but I feel like a lot of my tutorials are focused on bass all the time, and obviously that's only 50% of what we're doing in drum and bass, so it is quite important to take a look at the drums as well. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions on this sort of thing, or you want to know where to get uh, samples or to make or how to make a certain type of sample, um, then do hit me up in the comments and I'll do a video on that as well. So I'll just come say goodbye. Cool, so thanks again for watching. Hopefully that was helpful to a few heads out there. I can't stress enough how important sample selection is in this process. You know, it's an old saying, you can't polish a turd. It is true. Really, really try and get the best samples that you can in the first place or make your own so you know that they're kind of tonally correct. All right, so thanks again for watching. I'll have a video up next week. Peace.